الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على شرف المرسلين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله uh, Today we would be discussing bacterial dysenteries uh, The most important and serious of them all is shigellosis Actually it's not the commonest and some research is done here in Saudi Arabia It revealed that salmonellosis is by far the commonest and it contributes to around 57% uh, in the Saudi literature. While shigellosis contributes only to 14%. Actually, the majority of cases were found to be viral infections, but regarding the bacterial infections, then salmonellosis comes on the top. Uh, shigellosis is 14%. And Compilobacter around 9% or so. Uh, why are we discussing shigellosis in particular? Because it's a serious disease. And it has got a mortality rate that reaches up to 20% even in treated patients. So that's why we are concentrating on this. But by far, the presentation, the clinical features, everything is just the same. Uh, it's, they just differ in the prognosis and, of course, on the isolation of the appropriate organism. The objectives of this lecture is to, to have a short introduction that they have already done and the pathogenesis, pathophysiology, the epidemiology, the clinical features, investigations, the differential diagnosis in acu acute bacterial uh, diarrheal diseases and diarrheal diseases in general, and then what treatment should we offer to our patient and how is the prognosis. Uh, the epidemiology, uh, shigellosis worldwide is 150 million of cases were reported and 14,000 deaths annually. Uh, it's the commonest cause in developing countries. As we have just mentioned in Saudi Arabia, it's the salmonellosis, and shigellosis contributes to 14%. So what's the pathogenesis? The shigella has got different four species. The most important of them all is Shigella shigi, or known also Shigella dysentery. And this is the one which contributes to and mortality, and the mortality reaches up to 20, like Sonii, Flexinari, and Bodii. Uh, how is it transmitted? The transmission is mainly by orofecal root. So if somebody has got the diarrhea, he doesn't wash his, his hands properly, or he doesn't use an alcohol rub, then uh, of course washing the hands is much more better, better because it's the one which is uh, more of the bacteria and more of the However, alcohol rubs are also important and uh, maybe not equivalent to hand washing, but it's still, it removes around 10 to the power 7 of the bacteria in our hands. And if we know that this protection method and preventive method, the most important thing in bacterial diseases and we spread this culture in the community, then we are going to contribute to a good drop in the prevalence and incidence of the disease. So, uh, it's transmitted to the, through the orofecal route and human beings are the only reservoir of this infection, uh, or the main actually, the main reservoir. And the incubation, incubation period is uh, one to three days. In some patients, it reaches up to four days. What are the clinical features of the disease? The clinical features 
uh, of this is usually the commonest, by far the commonest way of presentation is acute abdominal pain and diarrhea. And at the start of the dairy, it's usually watery with frequent consistency and usually accompanied with tenismus, that's to say abdominal pain, which is relieved by passing the stools. It might be accompanied with nausea and vomiting and here. Uh, the problem would be larger because you, those type of patients are the ones that you need to admit and give IV antibiotics and even IV fluids. If you send those patients home, they cannot tolerate the medications that you have given. Not only this, but most importantly, they cannot replenish their circulation with fluids. They cannot drink water. They cannot drink juices and fluids that might replace the diarrhea. So those type of patients you have to admit to hospital and we will be discussing this in the indications for admission but by far nausea and vomiting are quite common and the patient might give you a history of contact with a patient with diarrhea or there might be no history. Sometimes there is a, there is a history of travel to areas where this type of dairy is common, usually third world countries uh, or even here local and sometimes uh, the food, you know, the food the processors in the restaurants. Um, in an interesting study done by uh, an infectious disease consultant in King Fahad Hospital, he came up with 10% uh, of the individuals working in the restaurants are having uh, dysenteries, some sort or another of dysentery that could be transmitted easily to people. And in this COVID-19 era, uh, we have stopped buying from the restaurants. And I think uh, if somebody has studied the incidence of diarrhea nowadays, I'm sure it would be much less than before. So what are the clinical examination features? First of all, we have to look at the patient, how he looks like. Does he look very sick, ill, febrile? What about his temperature? Is it of low grade or high grade? Is it associated with sweating, uh, chills, rigors? Because that's the presence of chills and rigors uh, means that the patient might have a hidden abscesses either in the intestine or somewhere in the body. And it's important to do the vital signs looking at tachycardia. What about the volume of the pulse? Is it a weak pulse and thready? Is it how, how much is the blood pressure? Is he dropping his blood pressure? Because septic shock is one of the common causes. And last, last week we have seen a patient who presented with acute diarrheal disease and he went into shock which was diagnosed as septic shock. Fortunately, he made it and he was fine when we saw the patient. So, uh, what about chest cardiovascular systems? Usually there is nothing unless the patient is known to have a disease uh, confined to those uh, systems. Abdominal examination is of paramount importance. We are looking for a soft abdomen or a board-like abdomen in patients with surgical complications such as perforation. Uh, they might initially have a localized tenderness due to localized peritonitis. So we have to make sure about this by proper examination of the abdomen. Looking initially at movement with uh, breathing uh, and then is it soft or board like abdomen? Is it tender? The tenderness, is it localized or generalized? And what about the bowel sounds? Are they exaggerated, like in acute diarrheal diseases, or are they uh, absent in patients with uh, acute uh, abdominal catastrophes such as perforation? So those are the most important clinical features that we have to look at. What's the differential diagnosis? As we have mentioned, salmonella is one of the commonest uh, 
from Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia and it contributes and attributes around 57% of all diarrheal diseases, then Compilobacter, the E. coli, and the Intamoeba histolytica. Uh, it's important here to mention in Intamoeba histolytica, the diarrhea is usually bloody, just like in Shigellosis. And the second thing is that uh, uh, initially in Shigellosis, it's watery, but as the disease progresses, it becomes bloody. And in Tamiba Hysteretica, it's also bloody. So how can we differentiate clinically? Clinically, we have to ask the patient about the amount of the stool. If the amount of the stool is small, then this is most likely in Tamiba Hysteretica. If it's a large amount, this is most likely shigellosis. But there is no hard and fast rule. After all, we have to proceed to investigations and it's very important to take a fresh sample of the stool and send it to the lab because as time goes on the diarrhea dies and it would be difficult to identify so a fresh sample for microscopy and gram stain is very important and also, rectal swabs are advocated by Minister of Health for every patient with acute diarrheal disease. Uh, diarrhea is uh, ident uh, notifiable disease. We have to notify to Minister of Health at the number 937. This is the section for notification. And we have to isolate the organism either by gram stain or culture and sensitivity we have of course to do the routines complete blood count looking for leukocytosis looking at the hemoglobin because it's a bloody sort of diarrhea maybe the patient is passing lots of blood leading to anemia we have to look at this and treat and correct what about the biochemistry is it complicated by acute renal failure uh, we have to look at the urea and creatinine and in acute renal failure, you would find the uh, increment in both urea and, and, and creatinine is just the same. Like if it's double, the urea is double the normal, then the creatinine would be double the normal. And this is uh, an important feature of acute renal failure. Uh, unlike chronic renal failure where you would find the creatinine is much higher than the blood urea. This is important to differentiate in another, in, in, in addition to other things like ultrasound of the abdomen, which in case of uh, acute renal failure would be normal, while in chronic renal failure the kidneys are usually shrunken and um, there is no corticomedullary differentiation uh, except in patients with uh, polycystic disease of the kidney where the kidneys would be large but still there would be no corticomedullary differentiation this is just by and by you are going to study this in nephrology later on we have to look at the liver function test because those uh, acute diarrhea bacterial infections might also through hematogenous spread go to the liver and lead to hepatitis they might go to the brain and form an abscess they might go they might go anywhere and form an abscess in the body so sometimes if there is localized peritonitis we have to proceed with abdominal ultrasound and even abdominal ct scan what are the complications septic uh, septic shock, septicemia, sepsis, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and it's better to be acquainted with these uh, terminologies. Sepsis is just presence of multiplying bacteria in the blood, and uh, sepsis is the pr presence of infection that leads to uh, SIR, that's to say systemic inflammatory response while septicemia is the presence of multiplying uh, bacteria in the blood and septic shock means the patient starts to go into hypotension 
and this hypotension is usually cannot be corrected by fluid alone. Characteristically, patients in septic shock, even if you give three to four liters uh, of fluids, still they would continue to be hypotensive unless you would start the norepinephrine, which are the inotropes, then at that time the patient might start to respond. And usually it's a fatal complication unless treated appropriately and in the ICU in a timely manner. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, in this you would find high bilirubin, high blood urea, and the kidneys are acutely knocked down. But uh, interesting enough, if you take those kidneys and transplant them in another patient, they would work. So it's probably due to the toxicity uh, of the bacteria, as you have studied in your, in your microbiology, the exotoxins of the bacteria. And acute renal failure is a well-known uh, complication due to the fluid loss, as you know, and distant abscesses, as we have just discussed. It could be brain abscess, it could be intestinal abscesses, liver abscess, and so forth. What are the indications of antibiotics? When do we start antibiotics for such patients? If the patient is ill-looking, toxic, febrile, with a temperature of 38.2 and above, and if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, and if the gram stain displays a gram uh, positive or gram negative organisms, and if the culture turned out to be positive, usually we will not wait for the culture. In very sick patients, would start antibiotics empirically, and when the culture results would show up, that's the time when we are going to uh, shift the antibiotics to another one. Uh, what are the signs of severity? Again, hemodynamic instability, a looking patient, and patients who are vomiting, those we have to take particular attention, even if they don't look ill, we have to put them inside the hospital to give intravenous antibiotics and intravenous fluids. Also patients with frequent motions of more than five times per day. And in those patients, we have to take the decision of admission for IV antibiotics and IV fluids. What's the most important treatment that we would give? It's ciprofloxacin uh, for both children and adults. Uh, I have put for you here the doses, but it's not very important to know the dose uh, because you can always check the dose from the BNF or any uh, drug reference. Uh, the prognosis depends on the severity of the case at the time of presentation, the hemodynamic instability, the timely manner in which the case is treated, and the amount of, uh, of uh, IV fluids and the early start of antibiotics all contribute to better prognosis. Um, how do we prevent such diseases? Hand washing is by far the most important parameter by which we can prevent the disease. And we have to wash the vegetables. We have to wash the fruits in a running water. So you're not going to put them in a bowl and then wash them. This is, this is wrong. You have to wash them in a sieve by running water. And uh, probably those are the most important uh, things we would like to say. Uh, in addition, acute diarrhea is a notifiable disease, and we have to notify the Minister of Health. We have to take the personal protective equipments, that's to say gloves. Of course, the masks will not play a good role here, but it's usually important to wear but uh, in particular the gloves, and we have to get rid of them as, as soon as we uh, finish the examination of the patient, and then to wash our hands. Because sometimes there are very small pores in the gloves that might still convey the infection.
and we have to instruct the patient to wash his hands as well as the caregiver. The caregiver is the companion of the patient who stays with him and take care of him. He has to wash his hands frequently whenever he comes into uh, touch with the patient or with his territories, with the area around the patient. Uh, by this, we come to the end of our lecture. And thank you very much for listening. I would like you to feed me back through emails. If you have got any questions, you can ask in the group so that your colleagues can have the maximum benefits. Thank you very much and see you later.